What were some formative experiences that influenced your career trajectory? It's really hard to point to one specific thing. I think there is an idea that we can tell the story of our lives like a fiction novel or a movie <laughs> where certain key aspects became uh, really informed who we ended up being. And I don't think that's really easy to do for, uh, you know, almost uh, 38 years on Earth. Um, but I can tell you a few things that sort of informed uh, where I am now. Um, and, you know, such a, my, my career and life such as it is. So uh, when I was a kid, I did a lot of like, um, well, not even a lot. I was not athletic, but I did do um, like uh, little kid baseball for three summers. I was on, uh, I was on a bowling league actually through all of, uh, all of middle school and high school. And then um, a really formative experience, I think, was in high school when I was in basically every band possible. Like I would skip lunch to I, I played trombone and I would like I would be in my normal band and then I would skip lunch and be in another band. And then I would like skip a class and be in this other band. And then I would do marching band and I was like a marching band officer. So I was the, the president of my high school marching band. I did. Uh, pit orchestra for the musical which is we didn't have an orchestra so it was really pit band but they used to give like the cello part to the you know trombone player and stuff like that uh so i did i i did a lot of a lot a lot of music and i did uh the piano on my own time um and uh in terms of like employment experiences I, uh, I had some jobs growing up. So my, my main job as like a kid was to work in my dad's uh, dry cleaner tailor shop. And um, it's gonna sound like I'm from another century, but I guess I, I sort of kind of am. I made a penny a minute um, as a kid. Uh, and then I got promoted to a dollar an hour and probably just cause it rhymed. <laughs> um, um, doesn't even dollar hour. Yeah, kind of rhymes. And uh, I would do that anytime I needed to save up for something like saving up for Super Nintendo, which I, I bought, you know, after working 120 hours, I guess, at the dollar an hour rate. Uh, and the work I had there wasn't, you know, too incredibly difficult. It was getting people's clothes off the uh, off the conveyor belt rack, like the conveyor that has all the hooks on it at the dry cleaner tailor shop. And I also counted change for people and it allowed my dad to like do the tailor work in the back while I sort of worked in the, the front of the shop. And it wasn't like, you know, a ton of hours. It was probably like, you know, three hours, three hours a day, like after school until dad went home. Um, and then like, uh, I had some other jobs. I had a paper route at one point. Um, I taught piano and trombone lessons to uh, kids in the neighborhood. Um, I never had any more than like three students at any one time, but it was, you know, enough for like, you know, gas money, I guess, once I was old enough to drive. And I was a lot cheaper to those kids' parents than like a professional teacher. Um, <laughs> science jobs. So when I went to college at Boston University, I got like a pretty big, uh, they, they they didn't call it a, a need-based scholarship because I think they might have thought that that was like insulting or something. So it had some name, <laughs> but it wasn't like, it wasn't the merit-based scholarship that like my, my roommates had. It was some other thing. Um, so I, I didn't, I had like you know, a good dining plan and some spending money that like my parents sent me for like my freshman year. But then I actually got um, lucky enough to get a, a paid research position as an undergrad, which was uh, which was really cool. That was through the Beckman Scholars uh, Program, which UCSD has had in the past. I don't think it I don't think it has it right now, but we definitely have had it before. Um, and yeah, so those are those are like like jobs. Then my research experiences, they sort of started out in elementary school. So I was in this program called Reach, which um, was sort of like the club for for like 
smart kids where they would go during uh, lunch so that we didn't like um, get bored in our normal classrooms. And they had a really cool projects. So the, the teacher that ran that program, uh, his name was Mr. Dupre. He died uh, not too, too long ago, um, way too young actually. Uh, and he, he was really an innovative educator, uh, especially for like the kind of school district that I grew up in. It was kind of a town in the middle of like a very rural part of Western New York state. And he uh, he had like the solar car project um, that we got to work on this like waterworks project, which is kind of like an art exhibit, sort of like when you go to like a like a mall and they have those like ball things where like the ball gets shot up and then it falls down into this like um, sort of like obstacle course sort of thing. But it was like that. But for like streams of water, it was called waterworks. That was pretty cool. It was also my first ex exposure to like computers too um so we would like take them apart and uh you know that was that was really cool um and it, until i got to grad school reach in elementary school was the most research like thing that i that i did so that was like really good preparation for uh for grad school um and let's see so some other things that i did and, and this probably gets to the heart of your question. Sorry, I'm going on quite quite a long time, but I'm almost done. Um, I did a lot of independent projects as a kid. So like, um, you know, I wasn't the most social kid in the world, probably, you know, in the 10th percentile of, of social of social ability. But I did things like uh, for several years, I recorded every single Star Trek, Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and, and Star Trek Voyager before they went from Fox to UPN, and then I couldn't watch it anymore because we didn't have cable, and, um, and every Simpsons episode. And I put all of those on VHS tape. I had like 200 videos, uh, and... I cataloged them and I had like an electronic record of them. Um, and I programmed games in QBasic on my parents' 486 computer, which I guess was de facto my 486 computer. Um, I am no good at programming now, but as a 10 year old, I was halfway decent. Um, and I'd never completed yeah, I teach engineering, but I'd never, I've never completed a programming class as, as a, uh, as a student. Um, and yeah, those are some experiences that, uh, that sort of became what I do now going back pretty far in life. Yeah. Is it better to seek a range of experiences in research or in a job, or is it better to focus in a single area? I think having a range of experiences is extraordinarily important. For one, you don't know what you like until you have experience doing it. And number two, these different experiences create these intersectional opportunities in your life where you can, you can do things that other people can't do because you have experiences um, as like, a tailor's assistant and uh and as somebody who you know cleaned toilets for a summer after um orientation students and their parents uh and also a good amount of scientific research you know before i had to actually decide what it was i was gonna do um and that has is it it pays off like in the research lab if you have a lot of different types of research under your belt, you, uh, you can combine those and not necessarily like combining because you want it to be souped up. You want to combine it because you want it to be unique. So you can look for the intersection of like human machine interfaces and organic chemistry. And maybe that leads you to some kind of flexible polymer that can interface with biological systems in a way that somebody that does not have training in organic chemistry can you know can do and it's not a question of differentiating yourself in like a competitive manner like like i want to do this because i want to you know beat everyone else at doing it it's because 
if you can do it and no one else can do it, it means it's not being done. And it means that there's value to be created at that intersectional area that maybe you can do and other people can't. And how is it related to having jobs like, uh, you know, like custodial work or like um, cashier type work? Well, there are many opportunities uh, in higher education where you can um, be in a position to broaden access to other um, members of the uh, the community that you don't interact with on a day-to-day -day basis and if you can uh, if you can empathize with different audiences you can uh, you can teach people about your results and why they're important in a way that somebody who uh, you know, had a very privileged existence for their entire, you know, career and never really left the ivory tower, maybe joined a research lab when they were in middle school and worked the entire way through and, and didn't really have these other experiences. I think that they would be missing out, I think, in the, uh, in the way in which that they can, uh, broaden access to research, appreciation of science and, uh, and STEM education in general. What are the values that underlie effective leadership in research? As a particular kind of leader that works in academic research, and this is probably applicable to any sort of industrial R&D position as well, so in, or national lab position, research should be fun. That's my value. The reason that I got into research is because Science is, and I'm, I'm putting basically all of engineering research into the category of science. Um, I, I, I don't think uh, that will offend anyone's intuition, but like science is the closest, is the only like legitimate route to magic. <laughs> and we, humanity is on the verge of like curing a pandemic that might have lasted a decade through the use of uh, m mRNA and adeno vaccines. And it would have been like unthinkable to do this uh, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, the, the fact that we're having this conversation over, over the internet and that our voices are clear and that our pictures are clear and that basically the entire knowledge workforce is doing work this way. Uh, most medical visits are done this way. Uh, and that is incredible and couldn't have been done. I mean, it could have been done in a very rudimentary way 10 years ago, but like the entire economy is now like, okay, not the entire economy, but the 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 knowledge work portion of the economy is running on these platforms that's that's something that would have appeared to be magic um you know the private uh, like uh private companies are now going into space uh we have multiple private companies with uh ambitions in space exploration which is which is incredible and the only way we're going to get there is with uh with with science and research. So the value that I try to instill on the people that work in my lab um, is, that, uh, is that science should be fun. And there are a lot of, um, excuse my uh, language, uh, shitty advisors out there who want to grind their students to dust and who think that that's an appropriate way to treat uh, other human beings. And of course we want, uh, we want rigor, but there's also a lot of selfishness um, among some people, uh, hopefully a minority of people that have positions similar to mine, um, especially at elite institutions where students languish they lose all of that interest that they had in science. They lose that, that childlike connection to science and magic and learning that I think um, that I think most of us start out 
going into research in the service of, and that's uh, that's kind of stamped out of of these people. Um, some other values that I think are important as a leader are um, compassion, um, showing curio uh, curiosity, uh, anything that you can do as a leader to uh, to engage your uh, your thinking prefrontal cortex, as opposed to the more primitive <laughs> sections, parts of your brain. Um, like you want to be selfless instead of selfish. You want to be calm instead of angry. Um, you want to be equanimous instead of anxious. And that's easier said than done, but it's well worth the effort to try to do these things and to uh, have that as your example. Do you have a mentor or role model? Um, <laughs> do I have a mentor or role model? Yeah. Um, or, and, and even, even do I, this was, uh, this is a, this is a hard one. Um, there are people who are professional mentors and you literally like pay them to be your mentor. And a graduate advisor could be a good, uh, a good example, or a postdoc advisor, or an undergrad research advisor would be a good example. And these people, um, you know, you, you get paid, but really you're paying them through your effort um, to be, uh, to, to be your, your mentor. And certainly um, the, the mentors that I've had uh, that's George Whitesides at Harvard and Jenon Bao at Stanford have had a huge influence on me and the way that I that I think about science and research. Um, George Whitesides is a uh, he's a super famous uh, chemist, but he is also known as like he's he's an, basically an engineer. You know now hasn't really done chemistry chemistry and quite a long time, although there's sometimes chemistry in service of some of the projects that go on in that in that group. He has a very um, uh, particular management style. It doesn't work with everybody. A lot of students in that lab uh, languish. Um, uh, may, and and uh, maybe when I joined the group, there were 20 grad students and 20 postdocs and maybe half of the grad students uh, either mastered out or left uh, left science when they when they graduated with their PhD. Uh, but that's because he had a very um, very particular way of doing things. Uh, he was interested in he is he's still alive he's in his 80s. Um, he's interested in a lot of different areas but very specific areas within those areas so you know he did like microfluidics and he's one of the the founders of the field of microfluidics and i had this project idea where it was basically i, w I had just come in as a new grad student and i'm like well maybe we can do like organic synthesis and make molecules in a uh, in a microfluidic chip and he said, um, I couldn't possibly be less interested in that. <laughs> so uh, one time uh, he wrote on my uh, a paper outline that I handed in that this is uh, that this is illiterate. <laughs> and there were just some things that he wrote on these outlines that were indescribably like mean stuff that I would never in a million years to say to my own students. Uh, but eventually these things became like the third rail in my mind. So when I'm when I was writing something or preparing a talk and I'm like, well, at least it has to pass muster with my grad advisor, because if it doesn't, then I'm never going to graduate and, you know, I'm going to also languish or leave science or something. Um, and once I got on his wavelength, things happened very, um, went very smoothly. It helped that I was with, um, and, and also like, I kind of felt like I was selling out my interests a lot sooner than 
I really wanted to. Like, I was really interested in the chemical origins of life, which was a, uh, a research project that he had in the group. But it wasn't really, he wasn't returning like outlines. He wasn't returning work in that area. So I joined this other project on unconventional nanofabrication using specifically a, a microtome, which is like a nanoscale deli slicer that uses a diamond knife to make small cuts in, in stuff to make like these pizza like slabs that can have different you know properties depending on where the pepperoni slices are located and uh and that became you know I became good at that I never thought I was going to do it but I became good at it and I became very interested in um in the applications that uh, that that technique was good for so I couldn't have predicted that ahead of time um so he's he's a, a mentor and I've definitely like internalized things that he's told me. Um, and I tell my own students some of those same things. I usually try to attribute it. Um, but it was often a fraught relationship. And a mentor isn't, you know, it tells you something about a mentor. Like they're not somebody who is just going to tell you what you want to hear over and over and over again. And you might even get out of their like, you know, graduate from or escape their tutelage and decide that you want to do something totally different in some approach of yours but you wouldn't know that unless you had this mentor so it can be a complicated relationship overall i would still join the same group i think that my um, phd advisor was uh is is one of the most uh unique individuals that i've ever met uh, he's probably also the richest, <laughs> maybe the second richest person I know well because he had, um, you know, a lot of success in starting companies out of his lab and stuff. My um, postdoc mentor, uh, Jeanne Bao, um, she is a fantastically uh, successful chemical engineering professor at Stanford. Um, she, uh, I, I was already kind of like trained up because I had been through the gauntlet of George Whitesides before arriving in her lab. Um, but she, uh, she did a lot for me. Um, number one, she's just like super supportive to essentially everyone who like shows up and works hard. Um, she's probably the ratio of like kind as a person to like successful like the best ratio in like academic science like very kind very successful and uh and it's just it's just amazing her like breadth of knowledge and uh and curiosity and support but she was also capable is also capable of telling you things that you didn't you know, you didn't want to hear at the time, but you're very glad that you did hear them. And this goes back to like mentorship. Being a mentor doesn't just mean, you know, being a cheerleader. So one time I gave a talk to the uh, Stanford Global Climate and Energy Project. They had like an annual conference in one of the big lecture halls. And I gave a talk and she said, you gave a great talk, but your Q&A session was really weak. <laughs> And she said, you had all this energy uh, during your prepared remarks, but when you had to speak off the cuff, you uh, fell short <laughs> and you need to find a way to bring that energy into your Q&A session and not be defensive when people ask you challenging questions and to to prepare more for the q a and to have a better attitude going into it and to speak louder and with more interest and that really stuck with me there's not a single i haven't had a single talk that i've given since then where i haven't internalized okay try to maintain the same energy even though i'm almost done we can almost go to the dinner or i can you know go home or go back to my office and that was that was super important um Further back in life, uh, uh, Mr. Dupre, Daryl Dupre, who ran the REACH program, definitely like uh, taught me uh, curiosity and to, to embrace like a sense of curiosity. Um, but I'm also going to say uh, 
my my mom so my uh you know not everyone's parent is a mentor and not everyone's parent intends to be a mentor but by example my mom is definitely uh is definitely a mentor so she um she had i'll just tell you a few like things about her she's an artist um she went to college she my dad didn't go to college um, but my my mom went to college for art at the rochester institute of technology in the 60s um, and it was you know they had a, a small at the time art program the rest of it was all engineering and i think they did that because they needed more like women on campus um at least that's the that's the rumor um and she was kind of like you know a young intellectual in the 60s and she had this um this box of books that was in the garage that i found one time and it had like all this sociobiology stuff in it like it had jane goodall's book it had uh it had a lot of like literature it had like five aldous huxley books aldous huxley is my favorite uh favorite author not a single one of them was brave new world so she was interested in like the more like metaphysical uh, uh side of of aldous huxley um and i read every single one of those um the, she had a piano so she uh she bought a, a, a piano uh when she was i guess in in her 20s um that she uh carted around with her to uh to you know everywhere that she lived that was the piano i like learned to play on that i uh, grew up on um she had a tape of the uh chopin polonaise in a flat opus 53 and also the uh, first piano concerto in e minor which to this day are my favorite pieces of music of any style um ever and uh and and it's not just because they have a i have a close relationship with them i really do think like there are qualities about those works that are like superior <laughs> to uh to to most other uh most other music that i listen to and nothing really affects me in the same way and not not just i think i think i think she was on to something with those being like her favorite pieces as well she also did all the fix all the fix it work in the house <laughs> um she was like fearless with uh you know power tools she had a, a band saw that was like for art but also probably for like home repair stuff um she sold her uh her art on ebay and i used to help her with that like and i used to get um some like percentage of the sales um because i was like the 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 tech savvy like boy so um yeah i helped her with that and uh yeah and then even things like when uh, when I get hurt, like injured, like I have like a running injury or something and I, or I broke my toe like I did two months ago. Um, I think back to the time when, uh, it's like in 2004, my dad just had prostate cancer surgery and was, uh, incapacitated. And then mom was at the, the, uh, the post office and uh and broke her kneecap in three pieces on the uh, on the pavement because she tripped and drove home on <laughs> with with a broken kneecap and i'm just like there was a scene in uh, the movie troy which did not age well but anyway the, this movie troy where brendan gleason's character who is uh, he played menelaus um gets hit in uh in the face with with a um uh paris's sword played by orlando bloom and this is like a lucky hit like paris is supposed to lose this fight and menelaus spits out his teeth and then keeps on fighting and that's how i picture my mom getting through that uh that moment and there have been uh aspects of like uh you know times of injury or defeat when I just picture that that uh, when I get I derive strength from the fact that my you know that my mom was able to get through this um, and even now like keeping uh, uh, taking care of my dad who's 
uh, who's 90 and she just retired basically in the middle of COVID because she didn't want to go back to work and, you know, expose uh, her herself and her family to the to the uh, coronavirus. Um, but she was like doing that full time job, plus all of these art and literature classes that she was teaching in the library, plus her regular job at the library, plus taking care of dad, which is a full time thing. And um, uh, and so, yeah, she's she's a, a mentor, even if she even if, you know, she's also my mom. Oh, yeah. One last thing. She went back to grad school at the age of 68. <laughs> and not many people are going to do that. So, yeah. What advice would you give to a college undergraduate about to enter the job market, especially during COVID? Okay. Given, given the COVID pandemic, what I guess what it so I'll give you the general advice and maybe this is something that I don't know advice I'll I'll say some things and you can take it as advice if you want um and how might that change due to covid in general okay so the classic commencement speaker thing is to say follow your passion right everybody's heard that follow your passion Lately, there has been a, uh, a backlash against the P word <laughs> where the self-help gurus these days say passion is bunk. Get really good at something and then that becomes, then you become passionate about that and then that becomes your passion. Um, and then uh, I heard this fantastic interview with Mike Rowe, who is on the Discovery Channel. Uh, he's the host of Dirty Jobs. Yeah, and has, a, has actually some executive functions on the Discovery Channel, too. But he, he said something great, which was, um, uh, which was follow your opportunity and take your passion wherever you go. That's very, that's very useful. Uh, what I would say in general is that passion is getting dumped on a lot and probably probably unwarrantedly so and here's here's why there on the superficial level you have a passion let's say you have a passion for energy or cancer research or animal rights or uh or uh j criminal justice reform or racial equity and diversity good luck making a difference with just that passion, right? Because millions of people are interested in the energy challenge. So what you need to do to like avoid being the drop, a drop in the bucket so that your contributions can actually move the needle is to figure out what it is that you can do that other people or maybe not can't do, but are really not that likely to do. And then apply that thing to the big picture passionate project. Uh, there are a couple of examples from my own, uh, my own career, and I don't know to what extent I'm moving the needle. Um, uh, probably, you know, probably not that much yet, but, you know, hear me out. So... I was interested, I did organic chemistry as a, uh, as a undergrad. I did stretchable electronics as a postdoc. I did nanofabrication as a PhD student. And I'm interested in solar cells. I'm interested in energy. Um, I'm, you know, my medium term project is to retrofit my whole house to be solar powered. You know, that kind of level of obsession. I'm a vegetarian in large part because of uh, not just animal rights, but mainly because of environmental impacts, uh, although animal rights is a nice byproduct. And so what am I going to do with organic chemistry and stretchable electronics and nanofabrication <laughs> to contribute to the energy challenge? And uh, this wasn't something that I could just like think of because it required getting these this rather deep expertise in these other areas. So um, let's say that I am 
uh, I'm like maybe in the, you know, 90th percentile of people in the field of organic chemistry, or let's say, let's say of scientists that know something about organic chemistry, I know as much as like, you know, more than 90% of scientists that know something about organic chemistry, not like a professional organic chemist, obviously they would know more than I do, but maybe I, I'm like one in 10 of scientists in general. Let's say I'm one in 10 of somebody that knows something about mechanics. Uh, I don't know a ton about mechanics. I'm not a mechanical engineer. Um, I'm not a physicist. Uh, and uh, But I know something about the way that materials properties give rise to mechanical properties even if I don't know like the continuum mechanics part of it as well as an actual mecha mechanician. There's another one in 10. Let's say that I know something about how to make small structures and how to fabricate them. So like nanofabrication engineering, maybe that's another one in 10. And maybe I'm even a little bit better there. Maybe I'll give myself one in 100. So now I have one in 10 squared times one in 100. So now I have one in 10,000, and I am the one in 10,000th person that can make an impact using these particular skills, these particular interests. And so what you want to do is find the problem within the big picture thing that you're passionate about where you're you can concentrate all of your your acuity your intellectual acuity in that one area um it reminds me of a star trek episode where they're trying to blow up this borg ship actually it's the movie star trek first contact and picard says concentrate all firepower on these coordinates and so all the ships fire where the borg cube is the weakest and it blows up now I'm not just saying I want to make the best solar cell ever. What I'm saying is we can develop polymers for barrier barrier materials for whole transport layers that interact with uh, with perovskite or organic semiconductors. We can uh, we can come up with mechanically resilient uh, adhesives that are conductive for uh, for silicon solar modules we can come up with a better uh, a better support rack for solar panels on the rooftop or in uh, in uh, in grid scale that might have a better strength to weight ratio using a composite material than a typical material and that might reduce the balance of system costs and if you can tweak any one of those knobs a little bit you might actually move the needle on the whole exercise which is solar energy production um, so that's an example where you can't really predict what your uh, what your interests are going to be you sort of have to you have to f you have to follow your opportunities and then when you have opportunities uh, you uh, become an expert in those little areas and after time and experience and talking to people and reading books and watching videos and listening to podcasts, you start to be able to put together a picture of where your stuff can actually make a difference applied to your big passion project rather than just, I'm going to make a better solar cell. That's not really going to cut it because a million, five, 10 million people want to make a better solar cell. Did I answer the question? Oh yeah, the second part. How would my advice, uh, so so what advice would I give somebody uh, like you who's starting out um, after spending a lot of time on uh, Zoom <laughs> taking classes? The good thing is that everyone else that you're competing with is in the same boat. Um, I really hope that that uh, that students in the Zoom generation, so those that um, basically those of you who are seniors, senior undergrads this year, uh, will um, will junior and senior undergrads this year will take to heart is the fact that you really do have to try to maintain these relationships, even though you're going to be doing them virtually. In some senses, it's easier because you don't have to get out of 
bed. Like <laughs> you do you have to get out of bed. You don't have to leave your house. You don't have to, uh, you know, give a sweaty handshake. <laughs> you don't have to have a very awkward meeting in like a professor or potential mentor's office. You can have the conversation like this. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity. Like I spoke to people that were my like heroes. Like I spoke to the economist Tyler Cowen um, on my podcast, and that was th the thrill of a you know of a lifetime to chat with him about things. Um, and that never would have happened in in uh, in the before time. <laughs> so if you can take advantage of some of these opportunities that lend themselves through the fact that we're at home on the internet. Also, you could take all of that um, time that you're not commuting and try to do something else with it or do coursework better. Like, uh, you know, maybe nudge that GPA up um, while, you know, while there's still time. Maybe um, do another extracurricular, uh, read in some area that uh, that interests you, um, those are uh, those are really good ways to uh, to spend your time and can help you like treat COVID not as a drag on your development, but as an opportunity to do some things that you wouldn't have normally.